We've got a good friend. You may have noticed that uh, a lot of people have been coming up to Brent uh, before the presentation. A lot of folks are, um, are happy to see him here to talk about a subject that many of us have heard about, but maybe not, don't really understand to its full potential. How many have heard the phrase crowdfunding? Exactly. So uh, he's going to explain a little bit about that, but also to tell us that that's really not a new phenomenon. Turns out that aggregating capital from small individual investors was critical to the widespread industrialization of the North Carolina economy that occurred in the late 19th century. This democratic capitalism, as Brent describes it, this phenomenon enhanced both entrepreneurial capital access and the ability of small investors to participate and then benefit from the resulting growth. So Brent Lane has been studying this. He, of course, is the director of the University of North Carolina Center for Competitive Economies. He's an adjunct professor at the UNC Keenan Flagler Business School, and he's here to talk about the history of crowdfunding. Please welcome Brent Lane. Do the switch here. Oh, we'll put my prom bouquet. My put on your tie. Thank you, Donna. Thank all of you for being here today. My name is Brent Lane. I'm at the University of North Carolina Business School. I uh, run a, a research center at the Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise, named for Frank Hawkins Keenan from the Keenan family, one of the I think most prominent family of industrialists and economic leaders and political leaders in education. So I'm pleased to represent them here today and talk about the history of collaboration between small investors in supporting economic growth in North Carolina, something that we now call crowdfunding, but has its roots, very deep roots, here in North Carolina in ways that shape our character in the past and today. I began my career as a, as a venture capitalist here in North Carolina, uh, investing in startup companies around the state, innovative entrepreneurial companies, back when we didn't even use the term entrepreneur that much. In fact, one of the things that I, I find interesting is how entrepreneurs has consumed many very useful terms we used to use in business. Um, but we invested in entrepreneurs and I learned a great deal about what can be achieved and what the challenges involved in starting and growing successful companies are and how important the role of investors is in that, not only large institutional organized investors, but small investors, what we call angel investors. Well, that's what crowdfunding is intended to do. As we use the term today, crowdfunding is the ability for small investors to pool their money to invest in enterprises. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of federal and state level securities laws that have in the purpose of protecting small investors in many ways impeded that type of activity. And there has been legislation passed at the federal and now at the state level that is intended to facilitate the ability of individuals to invest in businesses in their communities and elsewhere. Well, that's what crowdfunding is as we use it today. But I'm going to speak about crowdfunding and the role it's played in North Carolina and how for us it's, it's not a new idea. In fact, it is in many ways part of our economic DNA. I spend quite a bit of my time working with policymakers here in Raleigh, legislature in particular, on economic development issues. I've worked with uh, members of the legislature and legislative committees on, on evaluating ec economic incentives, on setting goals in economic development. I was very involved in the, the successful tax reform effort of a couple of years ago and involved in some ongoing work now on refining our economic development efforts. But we should often, more often ask ourselves, what are we trying to accomplish in economic development? Because too often, it's, we see it as, as it is very often practiced, a form of crony capitalism, a, dis, a market distortion by public actors. But there is another role for economic development, a non-governmental role, and it is one that enables communities to have some ability to both influence their economic future and to participate and benefit from it. And the most successful economic development period in North Carolina history is an example of that form of economic development. I tell every audience I talk to, we need to know and recognize, if we're talking about the economy, we're talking about economic development, North Carolina is a big economy. If you want to have results in North Carolina, you have to move a big economy. We are the, by, by 
international measures, the 28th largest economy in the world and the 10th in the U.S. It's a big state, a big economy, yet at the same time it's a state of many small places. But in economic development, if we want to have an effect, if the decisions folks make in Raleigh on use of incentives and other things that are the tools of conventional economic development, it is hard to move the needle in North Carolina. And that's why quite often we can be extremely successful in what is called economic development and perhaps have really little effect on the economic well-being of our citizens. And an illustration of this is that by the measures of economic development, that group of participants who, uh, who work on, uh, on city and regional planning, they sculpt uh, economic incentive packages, they are site consultants for large companies looking to locate. North Carolina's had an outstanding couple of decades. Site Selection Magazine, which represents the, uh, the site consulting class who helps companies find where to locate. By their standards, North Carolina is an extraordinarily successful business climate. 15 out of 20 years, we've been number one. But I look at the economy through a different lens. I've worked in economic development. I spent a total of over 10 years within the North Carolina Department of Commerce. But in the last 12 years working at the University of North Carolina Keenan Flagler Business School, uh, I've been working with folks in the economy across North Carolina. And there's a different way to look at how our economy is performing that I focus on. And it's not through the economic development glasses. It's through the magnifying lens of income. How are we doing on income? And based on income, North Carolina is 39th in the nation in our per capita income compared to our national peers. Now, per capita income, it's important to note, includes all income. It's not just your wages, it's not your salary, it's every form of income you might receive. So right now, we are, where well, we're a little bump up from 84.7, but we've lagged behind the U.S. for most of our economic history. And most importantly, in those 20 years where we were number one, 15 out of 20 years in business climate for economic development, we actually saw our per capita income fall further and further behind the rest of the countries. So as we were celebrating economic development success under several governors, under different political ideologies, we lost sight of something, and that was regardless of how successful we were in recruiting industry, our citizens' economic well-being was in decline. We fell from a high point of our income compared to the U.S. from being 93% of the U.S. down to now 85%. So that's an important decline. It's, it's something we were obscuring because we were looking at economic development rather than economic well-being. It amounts to a, an annual loss of $30 billion in annual income, and it really puts us back to where we were in per capita income back in 1984. So, what's crowdfunding going to do about this? Crowdfunding is just one of several economic development initiatives that have been uh, been proposed in the last few years within the legislature. And crowdfunding speaks to what I mentioned before. It is intended to facilitate the way people can participate as investors in their economy, in local entrepreneurs, or in entrepreneurship in general. And that sense is a very positive development. Now in North Carolina, we have looked to crowdfunding in the past when we were in economic doldrum. Some of you may be familiar with the period in the early 19th century where North Carolina was known as the Rip Van Winkle State. We had so many limited ec economic opportunities that much of our population left to go elsewhere. And it was in the midst of this period, one of my favorite political leaders in North Carolina's history, and I do tend to look at North Carolina history for inspiration and edification. One of my favorite leaders in North Carolina history is a, a representative from Rowan County called Charles Fisher. As he was the head of an economic development study committee at the legislature. Now, they did have them back in 1828. And in this case, they were looking at how North Carolina could revitalize its economy, or at that point, revitalize it. Wasn't re yet. <laughs> Vitalize the economy by investing in manufacturing. And there was a recognition, even before the Civil War and the effects it had, that in North Carolina we didn't have much wealth. We didn't have wealthy industrialists, wealthy families that could invest in grand new enterprise. But we did have the ability, if we could collectively work together, to pool our money and have the effect that could be accomplished by the union of many persons. Now, this was good advice and recognizes the necessity of time. And you, this, is, this is essentially the manifesto of crowdfunding. And then that, that 
good effort was, inter was, was interrupted by the Civil War and the period of Reconstruction. And post-Reconstruction, there was a recognition amongst the leadership and, and citizens across the state that North Carolina's economic well-being was entirely within its own hands. There was going to be no federal response. Reconstruction was not going to rebuild the economy. It would be up to the citizens of the state themselves to pull the state up out of the mire through their own bootstrap efforts. And that began a campaign that developed very quickly. You can think of it as a civic movement, almost a religious movement, to build mills, to industrialize the state economy. The state, which had previously been primarily agri agricultural, recognized coming out of the, of the Civil War that much of the raw materials of the state had historically been shipped out of state for processing, and then we would buy those things back from others. There was a recognition that that needed to be reversed, and it was a tremendously successful period of industrialization. And by that I mean, not only did they build industry in the state, it was sustainable industry, an industry that created what we think of, now we look through the mirror to the past, of the old industry set of North Carolina, tobacco and textiles and furniture. But those were the new industries of the mid-19th uh, mid century. So this represented the first entrepreneurial era in North Carolina. I was talking with, with David Stover a few minutes ago. He and I used to work together at the Department of Commerce back in the 80s when the term entrepreneur was a new idea. It was a new term. It was not a new idea. North Carolina has, has its own distinguished heritage of entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship rooted in some of the factors that create the greatest economic impact, using local skills, local management, local raw materials, turning them into value-added goods, selling them outside the borders of the state, and then re recruiting that profit back into North Carolina. That's how we build wealth. That's how we build income. That's how we build jobs. What is a mill? This is a little bit for my folks at UNC. A mill's a factory. This is a mill from, I think, Lord of the Rings. I think this is a Hobbit mill. Uh, this is not a mill. This is a mill. This is a 19th century mill. Now, this immediately evokes a lot of response in Chapel Hill about the terrible working conditions in the mills of the South, the use of child labor in the South. Well, these are actually mills in Lowell, Massachusetts. <laughs> but they are representative of the sort of environment and the sort of technology machinery and the physical uh, structure of what a mill meant in the 19th century. There's another hero of mine, some of you may be familiar with him, who's from NC State. Good. There's a building at NC State, I'll show it to you. Daniel Augustus Tompkins was one of several civic-minded business leaders in North Carolina who helped lead the effort to industrialize North Carolina after the Civil War. He particularly focused on the cotton mill campaign. The, with, you know, the rallying cry was exactly about bring, take the raw materials we have and produce the finished goods here, bring the mills to the fields. He wrote not just the book on industrialization of the South, he wrote the two books on industrialization of the South, on cotton mill uh, commercial features and on how to raise money. Uh, now, Mr. Tompkins was originally from South Carolina, but he, he, he moved to North Carolina and became quite prominent as a salesman of machinery for the textile industry. So he had not only a, a philanthropic and civic spirit mindedness to him, he also recognized the private enterprise opportunity before them. If we could build more mills, we could sell more mill machinery, and that, in fact, that was, the, that was the, the cluster that we could develop all the inputs and the final products and the production function itself. So he distilled down, this is Tompkins Halls at NC State, by the way. Note the date on this. Almost everything I'm going to be talking about happens between 1880 and 1910. This is a period, just three decades, of a tremendous revolution in North Carolina, and not just North Carolina, South Carolina, other parts of the South as well. But this is Tompkins Hall. Now, my wife is an NC State grad. I think she's familiar with this. This was designed as literally a textile mill on the campus and became the centerpiece of what was the beginnings of North Carolina State University, a cause for which Tompkins was also a champion. Now, I've done a lot of work writing term sheets for investment. Now, term sheets is simply what the investors say they're going to offer to the entrepreneur in exchange for their capital. <coughs> Tompkins came up with a very simple model that was designed specifically for the environment he was in, which is not a lot of wealthy people, 
Most of the capital was in the hands of small investors. If you wanted to attract and pool capital, you had to enable small investors to pool their money, crowdfunding. And he designed a, 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 a prospectus that would enable communities to pool their money and build a profitable scale mill, textile mill in this case, for $100,000, a little less than $3 million today. And they would sell 1,000 shares of $100 each to finance it and you would invest in it with 50 cents a week. This was the mechanism that enabled thousands of North Carolinians to become capitalist and invest not only in a private enterprise, but an enterprise that was rooted within their communities. Look at the heart of every small town in North Carolina. There's a mill built between 1880 and 1910 at the heart of those communities. And that, those are, to me, tremendously important structures in the history of North Carolina. Now, I also recognize this from investment, is that you don't build a mill right away. You have a four-year rollout. This is the sort of thing we teach at the business school at Chapel Hill right now in entrepreneurship. This is fairly standard. How much money do you need? How long is it going to take to deploy it? How profitable will it be? And in the case of these mills, they were looking at cash flows of 10 to 30%. Not tremendously profitable, but profitable, and, and particularly profitable in ways that was widely shared throughout the community. Now, they were not speculating on some risky new concepts. These, tech, not, these textile mills were not startups in a brand new industry. North Carolina had had considerable success, although limited in scale, in the textile industry. I'm going to run through a few examples that I think demonstrate something that I'm particularly adamant about. And that is that in North Carolina, innovation is not a new idea. Innovation is part of our DNA, and it's not an RTP phenomenon. It is something we have practiced throughout the state. Entrepreneurship is something that's part of our DNA and is exemplified. This is the first textile mill in North Carolina. It's in Lincoln County, which, by the way, is also where the pharmaceutical industry began in North Carolina, because during the Civil War, it was converted to an opium poppy processing facility to produce opium. So you have the first the beginnings, not only of the textile industry, but of the pharmaceutical industry. Alamance Platt in Alamance County produced the first global textile brand in North Carolina. Most of our production of textiles was fairly generic commodity goods, but they produced a specifically branded gingham plaid in consultation with a French designer out of the Burlington area and produced the first globally branded North Carolina textile product. Heckler Mill in High Point was the first steam-powered textile mill in North Carolina. Now, steam was the sexy new enabling technology of the time. It was the, it was the new energy source of the period. And our textile industry was also early adopters of electricity when it became available. And, and other breakthroughs like air conditioning were first adopted within the textile industry. And then one of my favorite examples was it comes so close to home. The building I work in is the Keenan Center. It's named for John, Moore, John, uh, John Motley Moorhead. <laughs> I'm about to get it wrong. But John Keenan uh, made most of his money as a young employee at a company that started based on an innovation that occurred in the Moorhead Textile Plant up in, in uh, Rockingham County, where they accidentally, in the process of experimenting with the smelting of aluminum, accidentally invented a process to make calcium carbide, which could produce a settling gas, which became the basis for a whole new chemical industry. So the roots of the chemical industry in North Carolina come out of our textile industry and out of one of those very successful rural locations in North Carolina. So you had a campaign to mobilize capital, broadly spread across the state, and it was tremendously successful. The number of mills exploded by the hundreds, employments by the thousands, all the, all the time, while we think of the industry in North Carolina as often coming from somewhere else, the textile industry was 90% owned in state. This was an indigenous entrepreneurial phenomena. In, in 1925, we passed Massachusetts, become the largest textile producer in the, in the, in the country. We peaked in employment in, in 1996, you know, almost a quarter million employees, and now we're down to 35. So I guess I can excuse folks who look at the textile industry in North Carolina as a failure. And I can only say, if you've got an industry that will only last for 100 years, like the textile industry in North Carolina, we would love to hear more about it. <laughs> the fact that that industry has declined in employment is also a reflection of its investment in, in productivity. We still have a vital textile industry in North Carolina. It simply doesn't employ people the way it used to. But it was certainly a stalwart of our state economy, 
based on local capital, local entrepreneurs, local inputs for global customers. So, right here in Raleigh, right here in Raleigh, you got three prime examples of that textile mill phenomena. You don't have to go far to see them. You got the Carolee Mills, Pilot Mills, and say so Carolee's that way, Pilot's that way, and the Raleigh Cotton Mills that way. They're all of them within about two miles of where we are, and every one of those built in that same narrow window, built by local investors here in Raleigh. So even Raleigh was an industrial center in the textile industry as a result of crowdfunding. So the thing that makes these particular developments so significant, and it's less important when we look at economic development in a big old state, is that the effect of this economic phenomenon had statewide possibilities. We have some other industries that have been tremendously successful that we've developed in the last few years. The biotech industry is, by almost any measure, tremendously successful but it is concentrated geographically. This was a phenomenon that had a statewide uh, function. It was value added. When I talk with audiences ranging from freshmen at UNC to legislators here in Raleigh, and I talk about value added production for export markets, I don't talk about the iPhone. I talk about pickles. North Carolina is also the pickle capital of the world down near Mount Olive, and it's as simple as this. What's the difference between the value of a cucumber and what's the price of a pickle? That's the value-added component. We did the same thing, and it's important that we continue to do so in our manufacturing, and especially when we use local materials and local suppliers. In the case of pickles, we use the local cucumbers, an industry, a pickle industry that developed in North Carolina, simply because the, the pickler in New Jersey refuses to take any more cucumbers from North Carolina. So they said, we'll pickle our own cucumbers. Thank you very much. And in our particular work with economic development with the legislature, it's, 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 it's very clear that the most important characteristic is that you employ your existing workforce. This is how we create wealth in North Carolina, not by recruiting companies to move their employees from somewhere else here, but to, to build industry that employs our existing residents. And most especially, this is what really distinguishes crowdfunding emphasis from traditional economic development, where we usually talk about jobs and income, is we need to create local wealth by involving local investors who, who, who benefit from and distribute the profits made. Those are the characteristics of that cotton mill campaign era. It drove manufacturing growth from North Carolina, the doldrums of the Rip Van Winkle era. Its entrepreneurial nature led to, to long-term wealth creation. And in very important ways, it made us who we are today. North Carolina is a different state than any other state. Now John's got a good, John Hood's got a good piece today about North Carolina's exceptionalism. In many ways, it's not. But in one way it is, is that North Carolina, for almost 100 years, was simultaneously the most rural state in the U.S., in terms of percent of people outside of the cities, and the most industrialized percent of employment in manufacturing. And that cemented in place the economic and demographic structure we have today, which has created much of the political discussion that you're hearing about the rural divide and some of the other challenges and issues we have. So, in our case, population centers developed around industry rather than industry around population centers. This is the location of textile mills in North Carolina in 1896. Now the size of the dot reflects how many mills are there, but you see it's a statewide phenomenon. With a few exceptions in the far west and the far east, textile mills drew, grew throughout North Carolina, and where they grew, cities followed. Cities followed the industrialization. North Carolina's investors, pooling capital using the crowdfunding techniques of the era built the demography of North Carolina. Still today, we have a collection of disparate metro areas and a term some people aren't familiar with, micropolitans. Micropolitans are essentially market towns of 15,000 or fewer who are separate from a, an adjacent metro area. We have a widely disaggregated population that, that's still a reflection of that industrial past. And all this is intended to show you these are the largest states by population in the U.S. This is the percent of population that's rural. 34% of North Carolinians are still in rural areas. Now I want to show you that. The only places called rural are these. So we still have a distinct demographic character, and that means in economic development, if we want to assure the economic well-being of our citizens, our strategies have to take that into account. We have, second to Ohio, the largest number of those micropolitans. We are still Mayberry. We're also high tech. 
we're also, you know, we're, we're also urban, but we still are a state of small towns, and we have responsibilities to address that in our economic policy. So the lessons from our success in crowdfunding our own economic destiny over 100 years ago, entrepreneurship and innovation are not something that other people have to teach us how to do. My folks in Chapel Hill will be happy to go out and tell you how to do these things, but we know how to do these things, and we've practiced them well in the past. Secondly, in economic development, while we think of it now as a government function, it should not be a government function. It has not been successful as purely a government function. Private enterprise is how we achieve growth. Now, I, sp I speak to you from the Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise. <laughs> but that's the simple reality. Regardless of ideology or politics or anything else, economic development as programmatic tools, as use of incentives, can touch no more than a few companies in a state full of hundreds of thousands. You have to instead adopt policies that benefit and facilitate enterprise across the state and across industry and across organizational structure. If you want to do anything to move the needle, it takes scale and scope. It's back to you have to have a statewide effect. And it's as simple as this. I hear some discussions. We're worried about socialism. We're worried about the bad name that capitalism has in some quarters. Very simple. More capitalism by more capitalists is what we should strive for. More capitalism by more capitalism is how we all get better in economic terms. So I've done quite a bit of work with folks at the legislature, and I'm very pleased to see we've had a pivot no, oh, our favorite Chapel Hill terms, a pivot. We have gone from focusing tremendously on targeted interventions, of which we were quite proud, but we celebrated our focus on this industry versus that industry, our use of incentives, et cetera. We've pivoted from that to addressing the underlying things that were making it hard to be a business success in North Carolina. What I think of, let's just put it this way, I am not confident can business can help your business. I know we can hurt it. And in many ways, I think our focus on industrial recruitment and economic development turned a blind eye toward the ways we were creating friction that was restraining enterprise across the state. That has begun to be addressed in the legislature in the last few years, and I think with some success. In the last 10 quarters, I've gone from I'm talking about eight financial quarters, 10 financial quarters. After decades of per capita income growth that was slower than the rest of the country, we have had 10 straight quarters where our per capita income outgrew the national average. It outgrew our neighboring states too. Now 10 quarters is 10 quarters, but it's better than eight quarters and maybe it'll be 11 quarters and pretty soon. What we're seeing from the hard decisions that have been made at the legislature to do small things tax rates, regulatory reform, other small things that you don't get to cut ribbons on, you're seeing the kind of incremental benefits that are occurring across the state that you would hope to see when you make those systemic improvements. So higher growth than our neighbors. We're seeing benefits both in metro and non-metro. We're seeing benefits and in growth in income in general, but we still lag in one particular area and that's in property income, what's known as what we call investment income. We are still lagging, where we just say we have remaining untapped opportunities to help our citizens become more successful capitalists and benefit by increasing their income resulting from investment. This is a fun way to show what I just told you. And this only goes back a little bit, but I, I, th these, are, these are small but important gains over past performance. So. Our income in North Carolina, this is some work we're doing with the legislature right now. If we talk about income, it's too easy to think we're talking about jobs or just wages. Now, obviously, jobs and wages is still the majority of people's income. But pension and property income are also important and need to be growing components. If we want to grow income, we need to grow earnings and we need to grow in investment returns. So in total income, we've outperformed our neighboring states in the last 10 quarters. But as I said, we've been lagging the U.S. and our neighbors in investment return. So what can we do to increase investment return? Well, this is the new idea in North Carolina. Because we get 6,800 places that the government will sell you gambling. We've got 450 places where the government will sell you liquor. We've got hundreds where we'll sell you a vanity license plate. We will appeal to your vices. But where do we enable people to invest? How are we going to make more and better capitalists? 
Well, crowdfunding is, a, is at, least a, at least addresses that opportunity. I would say, I wouldn't call it necessary. It's helpful, but it is far from sufficient. But I think it demonstrates the right direction in our political discussion. How do we enable more people to become capitalists? This is a step on that direction. There have been several other proposals, some good, some bad. But I think they demonstrate the political opportunity and perhaps the economic necessity of increasing people's ability to participate in the economy as investors. So that, that generation of in industry we developed in the 19th century, we see examples of them today. In our work with the legislature on the economic development and the use of incentives, there were si some simple characteristics we look for today to maximize economic benefit. We look for companies that are headquartered here who are not growing in a, what unfortunately we too often call distressed or rural areas, despite the disadvantages there, but that there are indeed regional advantages of those locations. Again, they're doing value-added production for export market, and when they have local investors, when they make money, it's shared within the economy. One of the things I have to do quite a bit of is dissuade people that rural North Carolina, one, is all the same. It's not all the same. Two, that it's all in distress. We've had a few generations of policy folks whose job was to talk about poor rural North Carolina, how it needed government help. That has been a very persuasive message, and we've convinced ourselves that that's true. But I don't look at North Carolina that way. I look at North Carolina through the population of, of, of growing companies. These are the companies, the high-impact companies that are growing across North Carolina. We still have a tremendously fertile seedbed of entrepreneurship and businesses in even some of our most rural counties. And I'll get back to one more comment my hero, Charles Fisher, said that millions of our dollars lie idle in banks earning 4% that might be more profitably and usefully invested in manufacturing. Well, we got $350 billion in North Carolina in deposits, and the best you're going to get on the CD these days is 1.7. I'd love to get 4%. Frankly, <laughs> frankly, we're, uh, the treasurer's getting ready to sell $200 million of that $2 billion bond issue. How many of you got a piece of that? What's the interest rate on that going to be? Anybody know here? I don't know. I can't find it. But, you know, I might have wanted to add that to my portfolio. I might have wanted to have the opportunity to invest in all the good things that that bond issue is supposed to produce in North Carolina. We should be looking to our own capital when we look for opportunities, when we see opportunities for investing in North Carolina. Uh, I would like to have, I've got a 401k. This is the last slide, so I may go on. I've got a 401k. Y'all got 401ks. Once a year, we go through the 401k charade. How am I allocating my portfolio this year? I don't know. You don't know. I got an MBA. I don't know. It's harder for me to admit than it is for you. <laughs> but we get, we have tens and hundreds of billions of dollars in 401ks that if I had the option to invest in North Carolina by just putting a small amount of that in some kind of a structure that would provide me a decent rate of return that I would feel was benefiting my fellow citizens in North Carolina, I think I would respond favorably to that as well. Now, what I'm arguing for is, in economic development, the best way to do that is through private enterprise. The best way to grow income in North Carolina is to make sure that we participate as capitalists in our own economy and that we derive a second income based on investment returns. And that if we're going to ask people to gamble and to buy liquor, if we're going to support vanity, the customized license plates, I think we have a similar obligation to make sure that they have opportunities to participate as capitalists in this economy too. It has worked for us in the past. Uh, I believe it will work for us again in the future. And we welcome the ideas of the community on how we can best accomplish that. Thank you. I think there, there are inevitably a few other small changes that have added friction 
Uh, I think mainly this is a matter of public awareness. We've created an environment where people expect to be employees at best and where we talk of income in terms of wages and salary only. We've got to enlarge the discussion and recognize that as a state we need to all become investors as well and that's a matter of you know, sort of, sort of policy emphasis I think within the legislature and elsewhere. Uh, one of the things that happens is we fall prey to schemes that are presented to the legislature that capitalize on some of the appeal of this, and I need not mention any names today, but there's always going to be someone hatching a tax credit scheme that will give a particularly targeted industry investor group an opportunity to get a tax credit for certain economic activity. Not only does that distort the economy, but it also limits the benefits to only a very few select. Uh, I think as we look at economic development, we need to explore ways in which we can remove any obstacles that remain to this sort of private reasonable obstacle. I have to say, I'm frightened to death of crowdfunding liberalization because it just so, it's so vulnerable to fraud and scams. Uh, the next headlines you're going to read about crowdfunding are how many people got ripped off. And that's inevitable. Things will lose money. You have to have a robust system. But it is something that I think can be vulnerable to uh, to fraud. Uh, I think there are other structures, uh, that some of them coming right out of the existing private industry uh, or private equity markets that would enable to people to participate in a portfolio that invest in North Carolina. But sometimes I think it's as simple as let me buy a piece of the bond issue. Let's issue bonds backed by ourselves. Why should the investment returns and the fees that get generated go out of state? If you're telling me this bond issue is going to be good for North Carolina and good for our incomes, well, you can make sure it's also good for my investment portfolio by allowing me to participate. I don't think anyone's working to prohibit us from doing that. I simply think it's not been recognized as a policy opportunity and it's certainly not a policy priority. How do you balance uh, this crowdfunding initiative that you're espousing with foreign direct investment that you've also worked at with in the past? I mean, is there a conflict in policy? No, no, there's no. No, I, I, I don't think you need to balance out foreign direct, foreign direct investment is going to occur regardless. It's certainly a positive for our economy. And we're not looking for a state where 100% of all things are owned by local investors. We, do, I th we will benefit from increased participation in the economy. Uh, but I don't think there's any need to balance foreign direct investment or out-of-state investment with local investment or local ownership. I don't believe there is. No, it's a, it's a huge economy. But I will say, one of, one of the ins things inspirational about working with sort of growth companies that I see day to day in our state economy and that I see historically shape the landscape is a hundred companies could dramatically change the economy of areas of North Carolina. A hundred companies. Because some of them exist today and they still continue to shape their community. This is not a phenomenon that we need thousands of. A hundred companies shape the economy of North Carolina for, for a century. And I think we have similar seeds like, of opportunity like that in North Carolina today. I don't mean to make that a focus of the discussion, but I do want to raise it as an example of, of, of an investment opportunity that's intended to benefit the state economy that we don't participate in directly. Uh, you could reasonably ask, as I would do, if I'm an investor, this outside of bond issues, bond issues are a well-established market and people know how to behave. Uh, but generally, if, if someone's starting a company and you don't have the support of local investors who should know you best, why should an outside investor be encouraged to, to support it? So I don't want to overemphasize the bond issue, but I think it is a contrast to the other ways in which government does intervene in the marketplace to encourage consumer spending behavior, gam uh, the lottery, et cetera, but we haven't addressed the other opportunities for encouraging investment, or at least removing impediments to it. So, Is 
sure these people who say they're entrepreneurs are not part of some sort of scheme, in other words? No. Okay. No. Um, that's one of the things that causes me some pause. Um, I've done a lot of work with angel investors, folks who are perfectly intelligent, but nonetheless somewhat unsophisticated private investors. Uh, some of them have been absolutely vital to launching industries and, 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 and successful businesses in North Carolina, but in many cases, they don't have the ability to do the due diligence to evaluate the risk properly. Uh, I think there's a, a very important role for the fund manager, the general partner who assesses risk. I mean, you, you pay a fund manager, in many cases, they added the sink value. Uh, and the other opportunity is the opportunity to diversify over a portfolio. Those are not, not things that are part of the crowdfunding model as it exists right now. But I think things that we should be looking for creating vehicles where they could do that. And, and by when I say creating vehicles, I by no means mean the government should do this. I, I, I would challenge my colleagues at the business school, the folks who work in corporate finance, to say, is there an instrument that would enable a broader swath of the North Carolina population to participate in ways that, uh, that benefit economically as the state economy grows? Whether it's bond issues or other mechanisms by which you could do that. I do know having, having helped companies raise money, and having organized funds in North Carolina, it is difficult to raise money in North Carolina. It should be, and as opposed to say the West Coast and Silicon Valley. Uh, Let's just say our investors have experienced downside more often than upside, so they're more confident about the risk involved than they are and about the profits of it. So you have to provide ways to diversify that risk away through portfolio and, and, and qualified fund management. Okay. Just a subtle problem. The follow-up to Joy's question is the exploits the subtlety of the Well, I will continue to defer to the expertise on, on bonds in the room. Uh, there, is, there is an area between the very highly structured bond market with very well-established risk and reward criteria and crowdfunding, which is this free-for-all concept that's encouraging people to participate in entrepreneurial phenomenon without having a great deal of education about it. In the, in the middle is the structured institutional private equity and venture capital market, where simply most of us don't have the financial means to participate in that. That's one of many issues I think you've been bringing up that are examples of the, the small impediments, sometimes they're large impediments, the speed bumps we put in place for people to become more active capitalists. Well, who won't, I mean, is this cool? Is he cool looking? What do we do about that? I, one, I don't accept that that, com, uh, that, that dichotomy is, is irrevocable. I do agree it's a, in a highly polarized political environment where we pick which side we're on on different issues, we do assign you know, uh, 
very hard labels to capitalism versus socialism, et cetera. I think one of the things we can recognize is the amount of capitalism that we already participated in in some form or another that we, we view as very positive. The, there was a nice comment on NC Spinner over the weekend that the, uh, the greatest demonstration of capitalism going on in North Carolina right now is the explosion in microbrews. Remember, John? That is very true. We are seeing explosions in certain types of entrepreneurship that very much represent the phenomenon I'm talking about. A microbrew, a coffee roaster, the things that are cool, the things that are, are, are highly valued by a younger demographic, are, they are, are pure manifestations of both private enterprise and capitalism. And I think really that's the sort of phenomenon that's driving the interest uh, in, uh, in crowdfunding. So that's why I, 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 see the, I see the political dichotomy you're talking about. You know, I see people acting in ways that don't reflect that as a hard dichotomy. I think there's a tremendous enthusiasm amongst the young demographic for crowdfunding, and they may not even recognize that they are being capitalist as they do that. You, you can even add, even Gene Nichols has a 401k. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, um, one thing is, I think, a, a new way of, for small investors to invest in startups has become um, websites such as Kickstarter and Patreon. Is that and particularly, like at Kickstarter, it tells exactly where the business is located, so you can even geographically make your choice. Yeah. You know, that, that is what some of the, the recent le reg uh, regulatory changes have been intended to do. To, to take Crowdfunding is a very generic term as I'm using it right now, although it can mean something quite specific for some, some applications. Kickstarter, some of the new changes will allow people to actually uh, invest, essentially become equity investors rather than prepaying for a product to be developed later. I think that's the movement, that, that's the direction we're going in that I think we can, we can I was about to say, capitalize on. I think there is an interest that we can help steer in an informed way about this increased level of investment in capitalism. I was wondering about the, the students, how open they are to a more entrepreneurial type of, one of the sources of friction that you mentioned, I think, is cultural. And do you, uh, have you had time to compare uh, your students with, say, students in Massachusetts or California, where there, there seems to be much more of a reputation for that. Well, I don't know how much more there could be. Our students in, 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 in business school are, are extraordinarily entrepreneurial folks. Uh, I think quite often this is a matter of, of, of adopting the right lexicon. Um, Fortunately, entrepreneurship has been used to, to cover everything from you know, starting a business to being a social advocate. So entrepreneurship as a term has probably uh, annexed a lot of other functions. But I've, I, find that I, I find the drive in a business school uh, to, to promote, to teach entrepreneurial skills is higher than it's ever been. I went through an MBA program in 1990 where there was one class on entrepreneurship. Now we have entire curricula devoted to entrepreneurship. Now that's either a reflection of market interest and demand, but I think it's also going to elevate the level of expertise in the practice of entrepreneurship. I think it's a reflection of, of some of what we're talking about here in the dichotomy, is that there's an enthusiasm for capitalism and entrepreneurship that's sometimes masked by the political debates of the day. I, 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 I am confident that our entrepreneurial class in North Carolina and our entrepreneurial classes at my business school are the equal of any in the, in the state, in, in the country, in the country. We, we, see, we see highly varying levels of what I, business dynamism, entrepreneurship, highly var varying from state to state that I don't think we can attribute to any particular regulatory regime that that state has in place. We can, we can create a regime as they've done in North Dakota or Delaware where there's a preference for citing firms headquarters and things of that nature. But one of the, one of, one of the concerns we have in economics about the state of the U.S. economy is that business dynamism for the whole country, and this includes North Carolina, has been in a fairly steady decline 
the rate of new companies being formed, births and deaths, and, and the rate of high growth firms. It's been in decline nationally for about three decades, and the same things have been exhibited here in North Carolina. So I think a focus on entrepreneurship, a focus on enabling investment might reveal some of the reasons why we're seeing a decline in business dynamism, a decline in some forms of entrepreneurship. But I, I, I don't see any strong associations, perhaps some other folks in the room do, strong associations by particular regulatory regimes at the state level and the kind of activity I'm talking about right now. Uh, the good news, one of, one of the thrilling things about microbrews is I like a good beer every so often. No one promoted microbrews in North Carolina. We did, re we did remove one of the major roadblocks that enabled the industry to blossom. When we're smart enough to recognize or respond when someone comes to us with legitimate constraints like that, then I think, our, our, as, I, as I tell folks at the legislature, we're making a pure private enterprise bet in the decisions that we're making at the state level. We believe in the private enterprise system. We are enabling and releasing its potential in small ways and in large. And I'm, I, we see some very tangible examples of that being manifest right now. And I, I think the, the, look, the continuing hunt for more things to not do that are impeding potential economic growth is going to be one of the most fruitful things we do at the state level. <laughs>